Good evening, boils and ghouls, and welcome to my Friday Night Fable Frights. Tis me, tis I. Say it with me now, your old pal, the Collector. And I thought tonight we might dive back into R.L. Stein's first anthology of After Dark Appetizers, Tales to Give You Goosebumps. First published in 1994 by Scholastic, and tonight's little fright is called... Teacher's Pet. Shall we begin? Do you like snakes? If you're in Mr. Blankenship's class, you have to like snakes, or you're in major trouble. Let me start at the beginning. On the first day of school last September, Benji, my best friend, was shouting to me from my front porch, Becca, move it, we'll be late. I grabbed my black denim jacket and tucked my ponytail under my New York Yankees baseball cap. I hurried, even though I knew Benji would never leave without me. Benji and I had walked to school together every day since kindergarten. Some people think it's weird that a girl and a guy are best friends, but Benji and I don't care. We've always liked to do the same sort of stuff, like play basketball and baseball, and cook. Uh, Benji would kill me if he knew I told anyone about that. <laughs> Benji and I were starting 6th grade. At our school, 6th graders get to do great stuff, like go on a camp out for a whole week. We were supposed to have Miss Wenger this year, the coolest teacher in the whole school. Miss Wenger is the kind of teacher who takes the whole class inline skating, so that when someone falls down, she can talk to us about gravity. That's really cool. Benji and I figured this would be just about the best school year ever. So... You can imagine our surprise when we walked into our classroom and saw the teacher writing his name on the board. The teacher wasn't Miss Wenger. It was a man named Mr. Blankenship. Benji and I both groaned in disappointment. Mr. Blankenship was a strange-looking dude. He was really, really tall and really, really skinny, and he was almost completely bald. What's wrong with that? His clothes were pretty bad too, especially the weird turtleneck sweater he was wearing with the beige, brown and black diamonds all over it. He greeted Benji and me at the door and asked our names. I'm Becca Thompson, I said. Benji Connor, Benji said. I'm just getting things together right now. Why don't you two join the others and take a tour around the room, Mr. Blankenship suggested. The room looked pretty dull, not cool the way Miss Wenger would have done it. Mr. Blankenship had set up the typical stuff, reading corner, computer corner, and a corny welcome back bulletin board. The only unusual things were the five or six glass tanks placed around the classroom. I walked over to one of the tanks and pressed my nose up against the glass. Not much to see. Some rocks, a pile of dried glass, a stick, and ah! I uttered a shriek. Then I just stood there pointing at the long, skinny, hissing creature. I hate snakes. I can't help it. I just hate them. I hate those tiny black eyes that sort of stare right through you. That's what scares me the most. Those eyes. I wanted to turn away from the snake's angry glare, but I couldn't. I seemed to be paralyzed, frozen stiff, and my heart was pounding so hard I thought it was going to pop out of my chest. It was Benji who broke the snake's spell over me. He came over and shoved me out of the way to get a better view. Oh, a snake, he said calmly. But I knew that Benji is just as afraid of snakes as I am. I see you've met one of my little pals, Mr. Blankenship said to us smiling. We're going to study snakes this year. Fascinating creatures. Fascinating. Leaning over the cage, Mr. Blankenship turned to me. Did you know that snakes can live for months without food? Of course, they'd much rather swallow a tasty little mouse instead. Watch. He reached into a smaller cage hidden behind a bookshelf and grabbed a small white mouse by the tail. The mouse tried to wriggle free, but Mr. Blankenship held tight to its slender pink tail. He dangled the thrashing, wriggling mouse over the snake's tank for a few seconds. Then, 
He dropped it right next to the snake. I didn't want to watch, but I couldn't help myself. The snake snapped open its jaws and swallowed the little white mouse whole. I let out a groan as I watched the pink tail slide past the snake's teeth like a spaghetti noodle. I felt really sick to my stomach, but there was no way I was giving Mr. Blankenship the satisfaction of knowing he had totally grossed me out. Who's next, Mr. Blankenship asked, rubbing his long slender hands together. Who's hungry? That's when I realized that all of the glass cages in the room were filled with Mr. Blankenship's slimy, slithering, hissing little pals. Benji and I tried to like Mr. Blankenship's class, but it wasn't easy. For one thing, he kept adding more and more snakes. Soon one entire wall was filled with glass tanks. The snakes slithered silently, their black eyes following Mr. Blankenship. There are more snakes than kids in here, I whispered to Benji one day. It seemed as if Mr. Blankenship could talk about nothing else. In science, we studied about the hatching of snake eggs. For history, we read stories about ancient beliefs in serpents. For geometry, we made chalk drawings of snakeskin patterns. One enormous glass cage behind Mr. Blankenship's desk stood empty. Benji and I wondered what he planned to put in there. A giant python, Benji guessed. I shuddered. I didn't want to think about it. Every time I peered into a glass cage and saw a snake staring back at me, I panicked. I knew the snakes hated being cooped up in those tanks. Something in their eyes told me that if they ever got out, they would go for the first human they saw. I hoped it wasn't me. One night I was lying in bed trying to get to sleep. Pale moonlight washed over my room from the open window. I saw a shadow move against the wall. Uttering a frightened gasp, I clicked on my bed table lamp and saw a snake slithering out of my backpack on the floor. How had it escaped from its tank? How had it crept into my backpack? Frozen in terror, I watched it slither over my shag rug, making its way to my bed. I screamed and forced myself to sit up. I tried to scramble away, but I felt something warm and dry curl around my arm. <laughs> I was making this weird gasping sound. I felt something like a rope tightening around my ankle. Another snake slithered over my pillow. Two more snakes crawled over my pajama legs. Help! My frantic plea escaped my lips in a hushed whisper. The snakes tightened themselves around me, curling around my waist, my arms, my legs. One of them slithered through my hair. I started to shudder and shake. I shook so hard I woke myself up. What a horrible nightmare. Mr. Blankenship and his room full of snakes were ruining my life, but what could I do? The next day I tried to switch my seat to one far away from the snake tanks, but the tanks were everywhere, on the shelves, on the tables, stacked along the window ledges. Every day there seemed to be more of them. I tried hard not to think about the snakes around the room. I tried to concentrate on our geography lesson, the snakes of New Mexico. But just as Mr. Blankenship began to discuss the heat of the desert, I heard a thud, then Melissa Potter let out a shrill scream. I'm sorry, she cried. I bumped a cage. I let out one of the mice. Where? Where did it go? Mr. Blankenship cried excitedly. There it goes, Benji cried, pointing. The little white mouse scampered across the floor. Kids screamed and laughed, but Mr. Blankenship had a serious, angry expression on his face. Grab it! Grab it quick, he shouted. It's over there, shouted Carl Jansen, pointing to the window in the corner. Mr. Blankenship always left that window open, so his snake pals could get fresh air. Mr. Blankenship dived across the room. The mouse scuttled onto the window ledge. Mr. Blankenship grabbed for the tail. Missed. The mouse vanished out the window. Our teacher turned beet red. Even the top of his bald head was red. Now look what you've done, he screamed at Melissa. You let a perfectly good snake dinner get away. You will all have to be taught to be more careful, Mr. Blankenship bellowed. Perhaps an extra homework assignment will help you remember. I want three pages on the feeding habits of the Eastern Diamondback Rattler, and I want it tomorrow. What's his problem, I whispered to Benji. Becca, Mr. Blankenship shouted. I heard that. You will write a 10-page essay. But, but, I sputtered. And you will clean the snake cages for the next two weeks, Mr. Blankenship added. I clamped my hand over my mouth to keep myself from getting in even worse trouble. 
But I was so angry. I could have let all the mice out of their cages. Which gave me a great idea. Benji, I whispered when Mr. Blankenship had turned away. After school, my house, get ready for Operation Mouse Rescue. Later after school, Benji and I worked out all of the details. Operation Mouse Rescue would take place on Thursday night after our parents went to play bridge. The plan was simple, simple, but excellent. Benji and I were going to sneak into school and set all of the white mice free. We could just picture Mr. Blankenship's face when he arrived Friday morning and found all of the mice scampering all over the room. Thursday seemed to stretch on forever. I barely heard a word Mr. Blankenship said. I was too busy watching the clock, waiting for the bell to ring. I know I ate dinner with my family, but don't ask me what we had. All I could think about was Operation Mouse Rescue. Finally, my parents said goodbye, left all the right phone numbers, and drove off to their bridge tournament. It didn't take long before Benji gave me our secret signal. A single ring of the telephone. My heart pounding, I pulled on my black jeans and dark jacket and raced up the block to Benji's house. He was waiting for me at the bottom of the driveway. What took you so long, he demanded. You're not wimping out, are you? No way, I replied, although I suddenly felt as if I had white mice fluttering around in my stomach. Let's go. Half walking, half jogging, we made our way to school. It was a cool, breezy night. The trees shivered, shedding fat brown leaves. Shadows twisted and bent over our path as we crept up to the dark school building. Around the back, I whispered. The school seemed so much larger, so much scarier at night, bathed in total blackness. We found our classroom. Benji clicked on his flashlight. No, turn it off, I instructed. Someone may see us. He obediently clicked off the light. We spotted the open window, the window in the corner that Mr. Blankenship always leaves open. My hands felt cold and wet as I grabbed the stone window ledge and pulled myself up inside the room. I turned and helped pull Benji in. It's so dark, he whispered, huddling close to me. Can't we turn on the flashlights? Okay, I whispered back, but keep the light down on the floor. Our circles of yellow light swept over the floor. Slowly, we made our way to the table that held the mice cages. The floorboards creaked under our sneakers. I glanced nervously around the room. Tiny lights flickered in the blackness. It took me a long moment to realize they weren't lights. They were glowing snake eyes. They, they're all watching us, I whispered to Benji. The snakes, they're so many glowing eyes. So many snakes all around us, staring, staring. I forgot to watch where I was going. I stumbled over a chair. Ow! I cried out. I tried to catch my balance but fell against a table. A glass tank toppled to the floor with a shattering crash. I glanced down in time to see two snakes slither onto the floor. They uncurled in the trembling light of my flashlight, then moved quickly toward my legs. Benji, help! I thrashed out my arms. I turned to run and knocked over another snake cage. A long black snake rolled silently onto the floor, arched itself up, opened its jaws and shot its head toward me. Run, I shrieked. Benji, the snakes are out. How? Benji started. I jumped as a snake slithered between my feet. We turned to run, but stopped as our lights played over the enormous empty glass case, which wasn't empty anymore. A giant gray and black cobra glared into the shaking lights. The cobra arched its head up, opened its jaws, and hissed at us, its red eyes gleaming excitedly. When did that snake get in there, I asked myself. The cage was empty this afternoon. Run, I stammered, grabbing Benji's shoulder, but neither of us could move. We stood staring in frozen horror as the enormous cobra rose up, lifted itself up out of the cage. It stood over us at least six feet tall, its eyes glowing, its thick tongue flicking across its open jaws. As it rose up, its skin shifted and stretched, its head tilted up, its body grew wide, grew arms, legs, and we recognized him. We saw him. We knew him. We were staring at Mr. Blankenship. The snake was Mr. Blankenship. No! Did that terrified howl escape my throat? 
Or was Benji howling like some unearthly creature? I only knew that we turned and ran, dived out through the open window into the dark night, and kept running, running till we were safe at home. Safe. Safe from snakes. Safe from the biggest snake, Mr. Blankenship. But safe. For how long? Safe till we had to return to school the next morning? Trembling with fright, Benji and I hesitated at the classroom door on Friday morning. What would Mr. Blankenship do to us now that we knew his horrible secret? What would he say? He smiled as Benji and I entered and didn't say a word. The day went by like any other day. He didn't say a word about what had happened the night before until the final bell rang that afternoon. He dismissed the rest of the class, then turned to Benji and me. I want you two to stay, he said sternly. He moved quickly to block the doorway. We were alone with him now. He closed the door and moved toward us, rubbing his slender hands together, his dark eyes glowing excitedly. Mr. Blankenship isn't such a bad guy. He made us a deal. He said he wouldn't tell anyone we broke into the school, and he promised not to harm us as long as we didn't tell anyone his secret. Of course, Benji and I quickly agreed. There's just one part of the deal that I hate. We have to bring in white mice and feed him every afternoon. I really hate the way the mice wriggle and squirm as I hold them up by their pink tails. But what choice do I have? A deal's a deal. Here you go, Mr. Blankenship. Open wide. <laughs> well, there you have it, kiddies. Lucky Mr. Blankenship. He was never trying to do any harm, and now he has the luxury of being fed his favorite meal every day. I guess that's what happens when you spend your life being a good civil serpent. <laughs> if only Benji and Becca hadn't been so viperactive. Oh well, at least they have plenty of time to hiss and make up. <laughs> Now, if I was going to leave you with any words of wisdom, it would be this. Sometimes, some things are better left undiscovered. Got it? Good. Thanks for joining me for this little Friday Night Fable Fright. Do your old pal collector a favor and hit that little like and subscribe button. Ring the bell icon so you can be notified of when you get to see my charming features once again. And also don't forget to head on over to Instagram and join me at Old Pal Collector for more freaks, shrieks, and creeps throughout the week. And now, until next time, my dear Fright followers, good night out there, whatever you are.